program that we are delighted to be presenting in having Rime uh, Najami joining us. Um, the first time we've ever had an author uh, with us from Vintok, Namibia. Um, and he is um, going to be doing this program for this book that's just been published in the US, his debut novel, The Eternal Audience of One. Uh, and he's being joined in conversation by a writer who we've had the pleasure of hosting in in real life uh, before, uh, Sarah Ladipo Manika, uh, who is uh, an author of two really well-received novels. And I'll say a little more about both the writers. There's something, a few things in common that they share um, in where their books were originally published. But um, yes, um, Remy is doing this. Um, and she most recently in the US in terms of the books we've seen is a, a book a novel entitled In Dependence. And um, Sarah, I could use this too. Um, Sarah uh, is, yeah, so I'll say a little more about that, but we're here for Remy and this novel, and um, this novel, which uh, actually was published first in 2019 by Blackbird Books in South Africa, and um, you will see over Remy's right shoulder, and I think Sarah's holding up uh, a copy of that book, and to, it's significant to say, I mean, we're, you know, the U.S. publisher of Remy's book, and that's the way we're getting the book here in Seattle, um, wants us to be, you know, touting this edition and all that, but it's one of the things is important is that um, African publishers, in, in certainly in English and Francophone language languages, are beginning to be um, their books are getting more noticed and paid attention to more, and I think more writers are actually publishing in those um, countries and books, realizing there is a significant readership um, there, and and that um, that's happening and. And in Sarah's case, this has also happened with her book. She publishes with a publisher um, out of Nigeria, uh, um, Cassava Republic, which um, now does distribute its own books directly into the US. So uh, both Independence and um, her more recent novel in terms of the book actually written called Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream for the Sun um, were published by Cassava Republic. And you can see both of those, where Remy's already waved those here. So that's that's something underlying, um, I think, this conversation and and um, that they um, have some things in common that way. Um, Sarah um, originally is from South Africa, no Nigeria. I'm sorry, uh, but has uh, Nigeria and um, uh, England, and and but now is with us here from San Francisco. She's actually in the same time zone as we are here in Seattle. Uh, Remy's novel, you will hear him read from and talk about. It's the story of a young man. Um, originally from Rwanda, who is now in uh, Namibia, who sets out on a, an, a, on an odyssey, and it takes him various places in fairly rapid order. And, and this book um, carries uh, Vintok with it, but it also goes to Paris, to Brussels, to Cape Town, to Nairobi, um, and it touches base as, as he's trying to, you know, figure things out as anyone will, but with a lot more. Um, at work in in this book, and um, it's it anyway. You it's going to be a great pleasure to hear him read from it, and also um, he and Sarah to talk about it. The other thing, one of the other things that both um, Remy and Sarah um, share are, are the in addition to the, what they do as writers of terrific books, they each also do a lot of behind the scenes work to help um, other writers work um, be visible and be supported. And again, um, no one gets anywhere totally on their own and. And so that kind of work, um, Remy's founded and directs uh, um, an art organization called DOC uh, that I think we'll try and get listed in the in the chat, uh, some information on it, or at least it's in his website about, which is really to support literary arts in Namibia and, um, and that region of Southwest Africa. Sarah, uh, we know actually from various ways she's, um, uh, I say she's in San Francisco. She's been a longtime board member and actually is currently the board president. And it's really um, hard and, and sort of inconspicuous work from the outside of Hedgebrook, which is an internationally renowned writer's retreat um, for women um, on Whidbey Island, north of Seattle. So um, she, she thinks of this part of the country uh, for, uh, for various reasons. And that's uh, Hedgebrook, which has done so much to support um, writer writing and actually musical composition film film write, screenwriting and other forms of generative work um and draws writers from all over the world to do so so 
they will, um, you will hear from Remy and Sarah. And we also hope as they go along that you put your questions in the chat um, and Sarah will um, work those in toward the end. And, Sarah, and my colleague, Karen, will be putting in information about the books and the other good work that Remy and Sarah do. Um, we'll also uh, be putting your questions in. If you have them on Facebook, she'll get them brought over to the um, Zoom chat. So wherever you are, and by whatever means you're watching, please um, join the conversation uh, as this goes along. And on that note, for now at least, I will disappear and to um, say thank you all again for joining us and to say you are now, um, to please welcome it because you are now in the very good hands of Reme Najimi, um, the eternal audience of one and Sarah Ladapo Manika. Thank you both. Rick, thank you so much. And thank you to the Elliott Bay Book Company, one of my very, very favorite uh, bookshops. And Rick, you were very gracious in saying lovely things about myself and Remy. And you mentioned, you know, standing, you know, we don't do this on our own. And I just a really big shout out to you, the incredible work that you have done over the decades and to Elliott Bay Book Company um, we wouldn't be where we are without bookstores and people like you. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, thanks so much for making the time. Yeah. So, and thank you to the audience who are here with us on Zoom, those on Facebook, those who will be watching later. Um, thank you for being with us and you are in for a treat. Remy is someone that I had the great pleasure of actually meeting in person. Remember those days um, in almost to the date, actually, two years ago yeah, at yeah. the Cape Town Open Book Festival. And I remember reading Remy's book and thinking, oh, my gosh, I this book has to come out. There has to be a bigger audience than it already had. It already had a big audience within uh, the continent of Africa, but I wanted it to come out more further internationally, which it has done now, which is so exciting. So congratulations, Remy, um, for this fabulous book. And I'm just excited to start talking about it. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm thinking about that week in September when we were in glorious oh, and sunny spring Cape Town and uh, there was no, we didn't know what the future would hold. And I, I, I have to say, I was really, so looking forward to that in 2019 because prior to that I knew you just as the author of these two books and a lot of essays that I'd read and so to be paired with you and to, to meet with you at a panel to just be able to share jokes with you was very very amazing I remember best one my favorite was the one we did uh, with Makanaka and Bongani that was an amazing time just hearing your wisdom about work was amazing <laughs> well, 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 right back at you. Um, and uh, you are joining us from where you are based in yeah, yeah. Namibia. Yeah. And you have that, you know, forever memorable first line in your novel. <laughs> Vindhoek has three temperatures, hot, mosquitoes and fucking cold. Uh, what's, the what's, what's the temperature today? Today is hot. Uh, we've just switched over to spring. Uh, basically what happens at this time of the year is that you wake up one day, it's August, and then it's still cold and chilly, and then the next day it's hot. So this is like our, we literally transition from like winter into high summer. So it's, it's hot again. Uh, it's bright and sunny, windy, dusty a lot of the time, so you spend quite a lot of your time um, dusting off your bookshelf or whatever because dust gets everywhere. It's just what happens here. Yeah, so that's our, maybe our fourth unofficial um, uh, season, Dusty. <laughs> I should say that for the next month. <laughs> okay, so you brought in the word bookshelf and on your top yeah. shelf is yeah. the beautiful uh, American cover of the eternal, yeah. or the eternal Audience of One. Um, mm. They say you can't judge a book by its cover. But I think mm. the cover is spectacular. And I think you can, you can judge this book by its cover. I wonder if you can talk to us about the cover a little bit and tell yeah. us, you know, what, what does this cover say about the novel that people are about to read for those who haven't already read it? Yeah, so the story behind this cover is that when it was first revealed to me, it, I have to admit, it was, I wasn't sold on it completely. Um, 
I like the colors, I like some of the elements, but I wasn't sure it was the authentic spirit of the story until, until I have to admit, I was devastatingly wrong. They, they were, they, the, the scout press designers were amazing. They really reached into the story and found this depiction of a young man with the sun behind him, looking as cool as he possibly can be, looking towards, I don't know, the unknown. And then the elements are bold and bright and beautiful. And I try to I actually try to be like a sapeur and get a suit made in these colors, but no one was bold enough to, to cut that material for me. Um, and I think what it represents is just, I guess a bold re tell a bold telling of this story, and the brighter the colors are, are bright and vibrant, um, and whatever this young man is, Seraphin, whatever he's looking towards, I mean, he looks proud. He doesn't look uh, humbled in any way, and he, whatever he's looking towards, I think is the uncertainty in the story, because I think in this story, in this cover. Time is moving, but this young man does not know where it's taking him to. And it is my hope that readers will be interested enough to join him along for that journey. And so now, now I'm in love with it. It's, I think it's, they reached into it and brought out like the soul of the book. It's amazing, yeah. So uh, you have mentioned your main character, Seraphim. Yeah. This is mm -hmm. a coming of age story. Um, mm -hmm. for, for your main character and it spans mm -hmm. time and place so you go back to the 1970s as Rick was saying it moves between place um, the storytelling is not always linear you're you jump mm -hmm. around from place to place um, and time to time what drew you to this large canvas story and you know it's also it, it's it's I, mm -hmm. yeah let, let's just start there what drew you to uh, it? I think with when I started telling the story, it became very hard for me to explain Seraphine's journey or his parents' journey or the world in which his family and his friends found themselves in without exploring their narratives, uh, the, the ones that came before the places in which they find they find themselves in. Geography was a very a very easy thing to rope in because you know, everybody always comes from somewhere else if you look further enough. And then I wondered whether these people who they are now, are they, are they these people, are they just these people alone or does the geography come into play? I'm always reminded by Aisha and Hutchinson poem, the, the Mariner's Progress. And there's a line in it that, that says, geography is not only fate, it's also fatal. And I, I just, I remember thinking about it and wondering, you know, is this is this ultimately what happens to Seraphim when you leave home? Is it fatal? That, do you always take a little bit of home with you? And all the other places you live, do you leave them or do you take them with you as you move along? And I just wondered about that. And that's really how I wound up roping all of these geographies into it, because it was my feeling uh, that it was impossible to explain or tell his story without going into his parents background and where they lived and where where their uh, formative years were were lived and what they lost along the way on the way to not only having seraphim but providing with the life that he currently has and that for me was uh i think something that i really really wanted to explore and then with regards to moving around through time um I have to admit to you that I didn't know what I was doing when I was writing this. So it was all highly experimental. And I was just, I was figuring things out as I went along. Um, I knew what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say, but the structure didn't present itself quite easily. Uh, I was guided a lot by my outlines and all of those things. And then there was this curious thing that happens as soon as you get into a story things that you didn't expect to happen happen and then you write them out as best as you can um, but that jumping from time and place was a way for me to navigate the story because I didn't think just basing it in one place would be telling the, the whole truth. Mm. And Remy one of the things that I really love about the novel is you're really exploring migration within Africa mm. which yeah. is you know often you have stories of folks uh, coming from different parts of the continent going out. But here you have your main character, for example, his first big move is from Namibia to South Africa, if I'm remembering, Cape Town. Yeah. Um, and in fact, actually this brings me back to, <clears throat> excuse me, the book cover. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the colors in the book cover are 
uh, reflective of the Rwandan flag and the Namibian flag. That's one of the things that I mm. saw. Some of the main colors. Yeah, yeah. Those, Some those, of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> these, these, design, these designers were on, <clears throat> they, they were on another level. They really reached into it and pulled out a lot of things. Yeah, it's amazing. So, so I just want to go to that. The, was this a deliberate choice to make sure that you did focus on immigration within, uh, rather migration yeah. within Africa? And maybe you can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, all, the, all the novels I'd read up until that point with migration, it was all about uh, students from the University of Tsuka who moved to London or the US, or it was people from Kenya who'd wound up in the UK or elsewhere people from South Africa who migrated to somewhere in the West. Um, for me, it was deliberate because I don't know that form of migration, uh, but I do know that there's a lot of internal migration and I'd never, up until that point, I was very uh, naive about stories that revolved around people who moved intracontinentally. And it felt to me that my story could not follow that path because that wasn't something I was familiar with but most importantly not even only familiar with but I wasn't curious about writing that story and even though these characters move from you know Rwanda to Nairobi to Namibia to South Africa even the aspect of writing those stories was migratory in, in some way because it needed to explore the worlds in which that they're leaving the worlds that they're leaving and also the countries and worlds that they're going to. And I was more curious about what happens when these characters, because you know, these fictional depictions arrive in this equally fictional Cape Town of the world of the storytelling world. I was curious about how they would act there rather than they would in let's say Chicago or San Francisco. But to be honest, I don't know much about these places other than what I'd read or experienced in film or music. And so it was also like a, a storytelling aid for myself to stick with places on the continent that I was somewhat familiar with and could therefore imagine in the storytelling universe. Uh, you use a little bit of the real to build that architecture in your head for the storytelling. It's a lot easier when you know some of the territories and how the grit on the pavement looks or how the weather affects the people that was a little bit easier to bring into the imaginative territory. Mm -hmm. But the real big thing was, Sarah, I wanted to write to show that a lot of immigration or what we call immigration isn't Africa to the West. It's when you leave whatever sense of home that you have for whatever reason, for a sense of better. So mm -hmm. I think if you leave one town for another town, you're, you're, you're immigrating. If, it, if you think one town is home and that home is destroyed by natural disaster and you wind up moving in this new town, you're, you're an immigrant, you're looking for better. You arrive with the same dreams and ambitions, hopes for your kids, looking for shelter, stability, security, a way of life with dignity. It's the same thing. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not something that's, uh, that's only reduced to passport status. It's mm -hmm. have you left home and are you looking for better? Mm -hmm. I think that is for me, my definition of the immigrant narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, Remy, I'm reminded of the last time that we met virtually was a couple of months ago, it was in November. Uh, I was doing a conversation with Claudia Rankin and I, mm -hmm. you, you were one of the, my special guests at the end <laughs> to ask her a question. And unfortunately, uh, Namibia's Wi-Fi didn't kind of live up to the job and you got cut off but you had a great question which she recognized as a great question for her which was something along the lines of does literature offer the immigrant the immigrant writer a more welcoming permanent citizenship than the legal notion of citizenship yeah. and, and and when you asked that question and then got cut off i wanted to come back to you and ask well what what is your response to that question you asked I, th I think it does. Um, I really think it does. When uh, I look back on aspects of my life as an immigrant living in Namibia, I think literature was a primary home. When we landed here, when we lived here, it was very hard to adapt to this way of life, to this geography, to this place. And the Vintage Public Library was the first place on earth I had been to where they didn't ask where you were from. Mm. 
they just wanted to know your age so you could be either a junior or senior library card which determined the number of books you could borrow or the duration for which you could have them and you were let loose in this place with just all of this literature i thought at the time just from a purely book perspective from just from that place this place with books was welcoming and i didn't have all of the other pressures of not being namibian in this place with books that was a big thing for me uh, the Vinted Public Library was like a very nurturing place and a safe space for me in a lot of ways when I was coming up. And then in writing, I think it really does. The, the art of storytelling for me as well provides a more stable home than the places in which I might have lived or what I call home right now in terms of like legal citizenship. Because right now I can be the author of this novel, but I exist on the same bookshelf as Sarah Ladipo Manika, the same, the same literary community as Herodotus or Aeschylus, or the same literary community as writers from Argentina or the Philippines. Once you come into this place as a writer, there's a great sense of local, national, international, global, and world community stretching through time. You join this like fellowship of storytellers um, and it's it's wonderful even though we're aware on an intimate basis that we might not be treated equally in that fellowship um, I'm very well aware that you and Aeschylus and and uh, Herodotus and Homer and I are all storytellers now and that for me that aspect is what I find very welcoming mm -hmm. um, we're both telling stories and trying to do it to the best of our abilities mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, reel us back into a little closer, <laughs> closer examination of your wonderful text. And mm -hmm. maybe just as a, before we get to your reading, I want to say that, you know, you, like your main character, are Rwandan born, a family that yeah. fled, fled from Rwanda to live in Namibia. Is that where the similarities between you and Seraphin begin and end? Ah, uh, well, sometimes the baker's sweat gets into the bread. Uh, and I think maybe that's what gives it its flavor. Um, we share biographical details because a novice writer, there's maybe a little that you're not aware of or that you don't know how to create. It was easy for me to say Rwandan born Namibian because I understand that world. It was easy to choose Vinto Cape Town, Brussels, Paris, Nairobi, because I know these places or have heard of them from my parents, especially with Brussels and Paris. Uh, but beyond that, as soon as you start writing, you've created this character. Literally, you look at these people and you realize they're independent of you, your biology, your life journey, your choices are not the same at all. And when you're telling a story, I think the, the wonderful part for a writer is um, just letting these characters go. And I think that's where the similarities end. But I found a very nice and mysterious way of answering that question. And so I always say, all of it is autobiographical, some of it is autobiographical, and none of it is autobiographical. <laughs> so all of it, some of it, and none of it, uh, because I still don't know as a writer to this day, which part of a story, if it's in your head, how is it not autobiographical? So I'm still thinking about that. I haven't yet come to an answer, but this young man's choices are his and his own alone, and his adventures are crazy and zany. And I have this nagging feeling that if we're in the same room, we would not like each other. <laughs> I, I have this feeling we would not like each other. <laughs> well, Remy, let, let me ask you if you can uh, do us the honor of reading a little yeah. bit from your yeah. book and maybe set up the, the passage that you're going to read. Indeed, indeed. So I am going to read from the new edition from page 57. And what this is, is when Seraphine's mom would dive back into her past as a young woman growing up in a Rwandan village. And she has very, very fierce ambitions of leaving that place and finding what she thinks is better for herself. Uh, and this passage is very short, but what it does, it's really at the moment where she gets accepted to study abroad. And now she's preparing for this life ahead because in her head, in her mind, in, according to her young desires, she's on the path to better. She's leaving home and she's going to better. Yeah. Okay. 
So Seraphine's mom is called Therese. When she announced her departure to her parents, they were greatly displeased. They promised, they prophesied her inability to integrate into European life, but Therese could not be talked out of her decision. She tried to appease them with promises of returning with a diploma and the prospect of a job in Kigali, which would allow her to buy them the latest trappings of modernity, but they merely sighed and, oh, disparagingly to her, at her heightened ambitions. Boarding her flight from Kigali to Kinshasa with four other girls also bound for Paris, she was wowed by the size of the plane, the luxury of the economy seats, the kindness and beauty of the dark Zairean air hostess who made safety announcement and answered questions about the limited variety of on, onboard food in fluent French, heavily accented English and stuttering Swahili. Teresa's seatmate, Bernadette, came from a neighboring village and was headed to another secretarial college in Paris. She gripped her chair in fear and cried out when the aircraft made its ascent. She wanted her feet back on the ground in the rituals she knew and understood. Why did you apply for this? Therese asked her. It was my aunt's idea. She said it would be good to study, Bernadette replied. Therese smiled at the prevalence of aunts who encouraged their nieces to revolt against their father's wishes and their mother's acceptance of the way things were. Your aunt did the right thing, she told Bernadette. In a year or so, we'll be, you, we will be back, and then you will thank her. You will be an educated woman. The title drew a curse from Bernadette. To be an educated woman was like being deflowered by the devil. But a year is a long time, Bernadette said, and I am not sure whether there are any, many Rwandans in Paris. How do you expect us to fit in with all of the white people? Time, change, no Rwandans, white people. All the things that scared Bernadette thrilled Therese. I'm sure it won't be hard, Therese said. There are many black people in Paris, Congolese, Senegalese, Cameroonians, Ghanaians. I have even heard there are parts of Paris that are just black. And then there are German, Swiss, Spanish, and Italian people. You don't have to go with what you know. Therese's mouth tasted the possibility of diversity, hitherto just words on a vocabulary list. They were becoming people she could meet, hands she could shake, conversations she could have, and handsome, accepting gentlemen she could walk next to on a campus while discussing something worldly and grand. But you must be around your own people, Bernadette said. You need to be around your own people. Therese smiled at Bernadette and squeezed her hand in assurance. Then she turned her head and gazed out of the cabin window. Not for the last time in her life, she remarked at the strangeness of travelers who tried to take home with them. That's, one, that's wonderful again, you know, further riffing on the notion of home. Yeah. Um, you know, Remy, one of the things that I've heard you say on a number of occasions is that conversations around craft are often missing mm. in mm. conversations with African writers. So let's go there. And yeah, yeah. Um, perhaps not so much to the, to, the, to the issue as it were, but let's talk about craft. Um, mm. And let's maybe just start with humor. You know, I, again, your, your very first line is very memorable and it's funny and humor you employ all different sorts of humor uh, in your novel. So talk to us about writing humor. How do you do it and what role do you see it uh, taking in your novel? Um, I think for me, humor is one of our best adaptations to a very harsh environment and world. The, a lot of the things that we laugh at or that we find funny are sometimes slapstick, yes, but some of them are downright tragic. And I'm drawn to this notion that tragic, that comedy is tragedy plus time. And, you know, when something's in the past long enough, you might start looking at it funny. And I'm always tempted to, to give the examples of like our high school or university breakups, our young loves, how devastating they were when we were going through them. But now years later with hindsight, we can laugh at ourselves and wonder what on earth are we doing? I think humor allows us to look at things in our past differently. And it also most importantly allows us to question a lot of things in the present in a strange way. I think it's one thing to laugh at something and then to stop laughing and think, wait, 
what, why am I laughing at this thing? This thing is actually quite bad underneath or the humor can disguise a lot of things that could be questioned or critiqued much later. I employ humor because I think it is the way I have found best to draw readers into a story. When I'm writing, I have a desperate, desperate desire for the story to be read. But I also have a desperate desire for themes or issues that I want to highlight in the work to be there. And I think for me, um, when you quote a lot of things in humor, it draws a lot of people in. But once the laughter ends, I think there's something residual about thinking about what you just laughed at. And you, and you realize these, these people or these characters in a story they might have a funny way of speaking about it and the writer might have a, a humorous way of writing about it, but you realize it's a self-defense mechanism for the environment. And I've always enjoyed that aspect that when I've seen it in characters, in stories that I've seen or in films that I've seen as well. Um, and that's how I employ it. I think I, I, I try to employ it within the writing. It's I've tried to avoid slapstick because I, that's hit and miss. You just, you never know what you're going to get. I've, I've, I grew up watching this, um, this thing. I'm not sure that you know about it called Mind Your Language. <laughs> have you ever heard of that? I have. <laughs> yeah. So Mind Your Language was like, it was a, it, it was Maybe you funny. can ex explain to me. Yeah, audience. yeah. So literally it's this night school. It's a, it's a program that follows this, uh, these immigrants who find themselves in London, I think, and they must study English at night school. And they all come from various international communities and none of them are native or fluent English speakers and the jokes there are funny when you understand the rules of English or you understand English and I from that aspect it's like language creates community through the learning of it but also through the appreciation of humor through it mind your language is like uh, a series that I really enjoyed when I was growing up, especially after the third grade, when my English was like finally like on its way. And I was like, ah, I understood that, that reference. And so when I write, uh, I enjoy, you know, bits of, 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 of the way English works, like the sentence structure or the way a comma changes the meaning of a sentence you're literally scraping for any little bit of thing to make a sentence interesting and a character different and humor, you know, punchy. And I, I, I found uh, something like Mind Your Language incredibly, incredibly amusing. And so sometimes when you write, you those things that you've had as a young kid or as a writer or in your formative years, it comes up. But language itself provides like a good basis. The very rules of English or, or of a language provide a very good foundation for creating humorous passages and text. And that's how I go about, I think, creating the sentence in terms of craft. I look at a paragraph and I'm wondering, not only, not funny aside, okay, but is this descriptive in the best way within the language, within the rules that are existing already, or can it be better? Can this sentence sing? Can it, does it have, is it melodic? If it's not melodic, is it something else that achieves the goal? So I, I'm a very well aware within my, you know, writers have like crutches. Mm -hmm. And one of my crutches is sunsets. Uh, <laughs> don't ever let Remy describe a sunset. It'll go on for pages and pages. But uh, that's my crutch. But it's a question of like, this sunset that you're describing, are you successfully managing to make them feel what their character is experiencing or what you want them to feel? And then that movement of like moving language around paragraph sentences descriptions is the metaphor really that strong is it really that dramatic you ask yourself these things as a goal really uh, this desperate desperate desire to get the reader to understand and i think for me my all like again that desperate desire to have the reader understand is really what informs how I go about creating narratives and writing sentences. Mm -hmm. um, and you read them back to yourself and you wonder, hmm, mm, no, nah, it doesn't, doesn't have the right flow, doesn't have the right feeling, mood, tempo. And then you go back to the page and you rework it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love the, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we do as writers. But, you know, when you were talking about humor and you were talking about also how it can, you know, it, it 
it, it can throw a light on that which is serious or tragic. Mm. Um, I'm currently reading Ole Shoyinka's mm. uh, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth. And, yeah, you yeah. know, that already the title kind of tells you something. And it's just, he uses a lot of humor and it's a lot that sort of is uh, sh showing the, the kind of, it's tragic humor. Um, and, and, and some of that, you know, you, you also have that approach with your humor. But you have just, you've thrown out the word melodic, you've thrown out, the, you, you know, the notion of having your, your writing sing. So this brings me to music, um, because <laughs> for Seraphim, music is really important. It's an important uh, means of escape from, you know, his sense of home or not, you know, not being comfortable at home and so forth. And it's also a way of uh, him being able to make connections. Um, mm. So I'd love for you to talk uh, maybe a little bit more about what music means to your main character, but also what it means to you. Um, mm, because mm. I know you as someone who you're always <laughs> listening to music. I always want to know what you're listening to. Um, <laughs> and, you know, your, your writing is infused with music. And that's yeah. just something personally that appeals to me. Yeah. So uh, yeah. talk to us about Seraphine and music and Remy and music. Yeah. So in Seraphine's world, music is a time marker. It shows the character's progression through time, especially in the early OOs when uh, music was becoming this thing that you didn't just listen to on the radio, but you also carried with you personally, and that you could now for the first time share with friends very, very quickly and very, very easily. So not only music, but the change of the music industry through time in Seraphine's world. He's form of communication with playlists, the way he archives his emotions, shares intimate moments with friends is with music. And I think the reason he does that is because I think music as an art form really does a lot of work of communicating things that we sometimes cannot say by ourselves. I mean, um, when you think about 1970s R&B and the, the quiet storm era of R&B, how they, they're just infused with notions with themes of like proud and sexy blackness that sometimes you as a black person are not capable of expressing yourself but when you put on a quiet storm record ooh, the mood the mood is different and just like you can suddenly become somebody else and i think music has this ability to draw us outside of ourselves and make us be somebody else for a time for the duration of the song especially when you think about dancing when you're dancing, you're not your usual corporate self, but you're just having this great time and music is doing that. For Seraphine, it's an important way of connecting with people, um, with friends. He makes music for other people. He makes music for the crushes that he has. He has, makes music for his friends. And it's a definitive aspect of who he is. He is the playlist making guy. Um, and I think when that is your source of identity in the story, you can understand why all of these young people might really are hip and they're quick and they're, they, they spit very quickly. Like their, their dialogue is, is fast and furious because I think they grew up in that era when music is so accessible and you just, you can drop popular culture in your speech every day without it feeling abnormal. Now, I don't know about the past, but right now you can have a whole sentence where literally from start to end, you've used words from five different music artists. Um, and it's spectacular the way music integrates itself into daily life. And so in, in Seraphine's world, really music is this big, great connector. I think he has emotional blind spots and music rises to fill those things. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think for him specifically, mm -hmm. those playlists, when I think about them as a character when I was writing, I think he's got emotional blind spots and music helps explain what it is that he cannot communicate as a person, which is strange because he's a highly communicative individual, mm -hmm. but I think everybody has that those gaps. And for him, it's music. For some people, it might be painting or pottery or something that helps them communicate this thing that they cannot otherwise. Mm -hmm. But for him, it's playlist. Mm -hmm. For me, Ah, music is just one of like the best art forms. I wish, I wish I could be a musician. I wish I could sing. I taught myself how to play guitar and harmonica once upon a time when it was cool, but then I forgot uh, because I just didn't have time to dedicate to that, to learn more about the craft. But for me, music is this thing that before writing, 
um, like music, a song comes with like a complete world with a complete universe. It's like a three minute short story that's been sang, especially when it's composed well. And I love that aspect of because you're always hearing new lyrics, new tempos, new melodies. And then again, this aspect of drawing me out of myself because the way I am when I listen to particular genres of music affects my mood and therefore I'm not that per, I'm not the same person that I was five minutes before and I was listening to some, something else but when it comes to for example writing to get myself in a particular zone if I'm writing uh, something sad or whatever uh, I might listen to music that helps focus that mood not directly but indirectly it's part of the process i don't write with music because music is just so much better than whatever i'm writing and i'd rather listen to that so it's silence when i write but afterwards to gauge whether um to gauge whether a scene makes sense whether a sequence is cohesive whether a story is actually a story sometimes i sit and i wonder you know can i compile a score for it or can i find a mood board of sound and music that explains this and one day one day i would love to meet the people who are tasked with coming up with scores for films mm -hmm. because i don't know how the heck they do that but when they do it and when it's good you're like but obviously this character is the sound and you can't divorce them from it yeah so so when your book becomes a film you might meet that person um <laughs> So Remy, I just want to pause and give a big shout out to yeah. um, our homegirl, Sarah Ozo Erabo, who has an amazing podcast called Books and Rhymes. And maybe that can be dropped yeah. in the chat. And the reason I'm shouting yeah. that oh. out, particularly your episode with her, um, Move mm. in Power, is amazing. <laughs> um, she, she, she's, getting, she's getting you to give a playlist to your short story, mm. The the yeah. neighborhood watch neighborhood watch yeah and uh, you have this riff on Hugh Masakela's Stimela uh you, yeah. actually, you, actually, you, you actually kind of do a little bit uh, a little little singing there too or you know and it's, it's amazing it's so so good so I mean you know for those of you who want to geek out a little bit more on the musical uh musical connoisseur that is Remy and you know check out that podcast um oh, gosh thank you thank if, you if, if you had one song that you could match with this novel, what would it be? And feel free to kind of give us a little bit of, you know, riff on it, sing it yourself. I was, no, I oh, no, no. I, I know, I know you're <laughs> <laughs> No, so there or shall not. be no singing. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to, I know some people are listening through this, uh, to this uh, interview with their earphones. I don't want to give them ear damage, so I will not be singing. Uh, but if there was one song, I'm not, I was scared you would ask something like that because I've been thinking about, is there one song? But or there isn't, but I... Nope, I will tell you, I'll tell you the two songs that I feel could bookend it, mm. bookend. Great. The first one I think is Ismail Lowe's Dibi Dibi Re. That song makes me Yo, it, it transports me completely out of myself every time I hear Ismail Lowe's song. And the reason I say that is because I know that sound from when I was growing up and it played on the TV. And it starts off with uh, this very mournful intro. And when I was young, I couldn't place where this song came from and what it was about. And I, just, I didn't understand the lyrics, but the melody was moving. And literally, we grew up with this song in our house because, you know, we were one of those cassette families back in the day when every family had cassettes. And that song was transportive. And so I say that song first because I remember that song when it first played in our house when we were living in Vinter. Yeah. That one is certainly one of the things that I would add on to, like, the Eternal Audience of One's playlist. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think we should go out out of this world and do something unexpected and i will say it has to be bonnie m's one-way ticket oh, <laughs> the reason why i say one-way ticket is because you never know who your parents are until this song from their youth <laughs> pops up at like a at a house party and your parents lose it lose it like completely Lose it. I mean, you come and you're like, 
And you know how our parents are, Sarah. They're always like, oh, when I was your kid, I, I used to walk 50 kilometers to school and I was the best. And when I went to abroad, I didn't even do anything. All I did was I was in my dormitory. I had a scholarship. I was like, I'm like, so where did you learn this, this thing that you just put yeah. out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that, yeah, so yeah. That, that, that would be it for me uh, because it's a funk, it's a... It's an old school dance track that I think to this day, I don't think people have heard this, but it is a proper, proper fire song. And the reason I bring that up specifically is because uh, in the eternal audience of one, there is a scene or this immigrant community music is also one of the things that brings them together. Um, specifically when they're allowed to be not the usual themselves, in this particular setting that they find themselves in, when they're allowed to just let loose and not be parents or let loose and not be someone's, uh, someone's lackey at work, when they just get drawn out of themselves. And I'm telling you, Bonnie M, one-way ticket, folks change, folks change around that song. They lose, lose, lose themselves completely and you're like, dad, I know there's a story behind, this dance move, and you're like, how did you? Ah, no, nah, no, nah. lies, lies, uh, lies, lies, lies. Someday, uh, someday I'll be told the story. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Well, I think hopefully someday we can have these conversations and we can actually just slice in, <laughs> slice in the music as well. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I have so many more things that I, I, we could talk about. I knew this would happen. There's just too much to talk about, but I'm also keeping my eye on the time. I want to ask yeah. one more question, as it were, but then yeah. I also see that we already have a question in the chat, so I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and then if other people don't have questions, there's, there's plenty more that, uh, that I have mm, on yeah. my mind I'd love to talk to you about. I just want to say that the word millennial comes up in, mm. uh, with reference to your work. And in fact, mm. the, those who have uh, endorsed your work and blurbed it, myself included, have used this word millennial. I think I, I talked mm. about how your, yeah. your text has its own millennial beat. And mm. I think I'm remembering correctly hearing you at one point, maybe in our conversations in South Africa, talk about you, you know, you'd like this book uh, perhaps to be a way for people to understand African millennials, the curiosity yeah, of African yeah. millennials. So I wonder if you can just riff a little bit more on millennials and African yeah. millennials. Yeah, no, we are, we are definitely here. We're out here. We're in the streets. We're living our lives. We're trying to have careers. We're trying to make art, trying to make music, trying to do everything that the world expects of us, um, that our parents expect of us and that we hope and desire for ourselves. But it is my feeling that we're really sometimes a little bit misunderstood because we are not as old as our parents and therefore we do not have their struggles. And we are also quite aware of the challenges that they face in their time, but we're also aware of the challenges in ours. And I think what we're looking for, because maybe we're not given the space, is an opportunity to solve our present challenges by ourselves. I think there's a big empowerment gap in within a lot of African societies where people are age, you're treated like a youth until you're 45 or 60 and running for president. I think that's the only time you become an adult. Uh, in East Africa, it's even, I thank God the, the threshold in East Africa is a little lower. Oh yeah, you just need a master's degree to not be a child anymore. And I don't have one. So my extended family is looking at me like, yo bro, so you're not gonna get this master's degree. <laughs> But uh, uh, with African millennials, they're so diverse, first of all, because of the quantity and the number of them. And then they have very, very swinging ranges in terms in all of their experiences because some are stable and some come from very challenging demographics and background. But I think the one thing they have in common, for me at least, as I've experienced them, is this very, they're very in tune with the world but the world is not in tune with them. It's like this one way conversation where we know a lot about the things that are happening in the world, but the world doesn't know about what we feel, how we act and what we're trying to do in the world. And I think sometimes that comes from, uh, sometimes perhaps maybe ignorance, but also from a lack of empowerment here. We don't, we're not given opportunities to broadcast ourselves. And I think the versions of ourselves that we do, that people do meet are stereotypical, uh, I think narrow in some ways, but I hope that this at least shows that, you know, there's a lot in common between 
kids in Seattle or kids in uh, New York or kids in London with people here in like little old winter because one, I mean, we've all seen mind your language now. Uh, we all have a similar sense of humor. We have all read the same books, read the same, uh, watched the same films. We all fall in love the same way. We all hunger and desire to leave home the same way. We all have the same thirst for adventure, for exploring. And so I think that the question for me at the end of all of that is that then why are we treated differently? Why, why can we not be given the same opportunities to explore, to develop ourselves, to just meet and encounter each other? And I think that is for me, one of the plights of the African millennial, just empowerment to express yourself and allow and, and to be given the right to try and participate in problem solving because there's a big a lot of belittling that happens in some of our communities and i don't think that is right yeah you know uh remy i just want to just uh, probably close what i have to say because i can see we have questions and i want to get to them by saying you know thank you for this book thank you for what you do for other writers we haven't had a chance to talk about what you do uh, with dirk you're the the chief editor you have the editor-in-chief a co-founder it's such an amazing thing that you do there and also just the way that you encourage writers even beyond that i know during covid you were very active in um afrolit sans frontieres the brainchild of our home girl <laughs> home girl zukiswa vana and you know all of that so just big thanks and really admire yeah, yeah. admire what you do and um just thank you so uh, no, we're, 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 we're going to just quickly go to a couple of the questions that have come in. I think I'll take two mm. to begin with. Um, the first is uh, Cecile, who is asking about audience. And this also kind of brings us, mm. maybe you can have a, say a little bit, bit mm. about the title of your book. But uh, the question is, what type of reader do you have in mind when you're trying to convey to the reader what you want, what you want to get across? Um, and then we have a question from Abiola. Mm who is asking about your creative process and okay. what, what steps or rituals are sacrosanct for you to come up with the amazing mm. prose that you share with yeah. all of us. Okay, um, with regards to the reader, I, I automatically decide, or I hope that the reader who picks up my work is someone who has a very broad understanding of the world because it is my goal and my desire. And the, this comes a lot in the things that I enjoy writing is I love referencing or bringing things from as many places as possible. And then as a writer, the ambition is, can you pull this off? Can you have a character from a very, very disadvantaged background or whatever, suddenly name dropping or name checking Homer? And because a lot of people know a lot of weird things, but they're never given an opportunity to be the fullest themselves only in, in dialogue or character. So when I think about my reader, I, I always hope and pray that the reader is what I would call in tune. Or if they're not in tune, just curious, because at least look up some of the references or the riffs or whatever, because I, that's, how I, that's how I navigated Mind Your Language. I didn't get it, so I went and I looked up the rules of, I'm like, oh, that's the joke that they were saying. And then you watch it again, you're like, that, that's hilarious, that's cool. Um, but the reader I imagine is definitely always someone who is a reader. So it's not someone who is not a reader, but it's someone who enjoys a particular type of story. And so I think about how can I get them to read this thing that is slightly different or completely different. But my new challenge is, no, I'll, I will, that's, that's for another conversation some other time. With All regards right. to craft and process, uh, I am a cleaner. Uh, my house is clean every day because I try to write every day, even though I don't sometimes manage to do that. Uh, the process of arranging things helps me feel like I'm arranging things internally as well, because there's a lot of chaos going on up there. But there's something about cleaning your spoons that makes you feel like we're ready to tackle that conflict now. Um, and that's also how my wife knows that I have not written because sometimes the spoons have not been clean. And, she's, and you know, when you do those typical white lights, like, oh no, I was writing, but you're actually on YouTube for like hours. And this is like, hmm, the counters don't say you are writing. You're like, damn, caught out, you know? Um, so that's, I'm a cleaner. And then when I do write silence, uh, I like writing with pen first just to focus things because once you start typing, there's a danger of things going through all, you wanna put everything at the one time, at one point. So I'm a very simple guy. I don't have a, a lot of craft business, what, what. 
pen, paper, outline, and then try and start as bravely as possible and try and be determined to the end and then type later. And I saw, I knew Dango would ask one of these questions. <laughs> so so I, I'm gonna insert. So he's asking the question about when your book becomes a film, who should uh, act your main character, Seraphin? And I also, I noted that you have an actor narrating your book, Michael yeah, Boatman. Boatman. Michael Boatman. Yeah. So I was also, so let's let, dovetail those two things together. Who's going to act Seraphin? And um, who, you know, what do you think of Michael Boatman? <laughs> Michael Boatman has an incredible voice, man. Uh, and uh, we were very thrilled to have him narrating the audiobook. Lovely, lovely. The funniest part was when I had to send recordings of the Kenya Rwanda words um, yeah. and how to guide them, how to say some of these complex words that have vocal intonations that you might not be used to and then it was so weird when I was when I was recording those things for my what to send and I remember just how much one Kenya Rwanda is in this book but then also how little of my own native tongue I actually speak on a regular basis because most of the community around me now is English speaking I only speak Kenya Rwanda at home with my folks and uh, with my family um, but it was nice to just to speak it to someone who's never heard it before and say, so this is how you say this. This is how you say, this, it, was, it was nice to record that again. Um, and then um, the actor who would play Seraphine, jeez, I, I do not know. I don't, although, although there is this one Rwandan kid who plays in sex education called Eric Chutingatwa. He's the, plays the gay best friend of the main character. I think he would make a very good High Lord of Empire, though I don't know who Seraphine is. That kid, that actor has got a lot of personality. He would make a very good one of the other characters. I don't know which one, but he'd make a very excellent Seraphine. I've never, I've, it's interesting that he says uh, this autobiographical novel. That's, that's Dengua trolling me. Um, but I've always, I've never seen him with a face. I've never, I've never envisioned him as someone else. For me, he exists just in this book and I've never seen the actor who would play him, but one hopes and one waits and then we see where it goes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna audition for Therese. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let us do, you know, you know who, you know who when I, when I was thinking about it, it was like, you know, can you make a cameo in your own film? I was like, I would like to play Maxime. <laughs> Maxime, the barber. I was like, let me be the barber. <laughs> Love it. Love yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I, well, we're going to wrap it up since we've come to the hour. And I'm going to throw it back to Rick. I see your homeboy still has lots of questions vis-a-vis -vis Zadie Smith, but I'm sure you have answers <laughs> at some other point. But Remy, this has been such a privilege and thank you and can't wait to see what you what you write next thank you sarah it's really 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 tough that you make you made time to speak with me uh, after the last time we saw each other um i really appreciate your guidance and your wisdom and i enjoy seeing you talk with other writers also the work you're doing with other writers is really really encouraging and inspiring and uh, i wish you all the best i think that's coming as well and uh to the elliot bay book company for making the time and space i i i appreciate this immensely thank you thank you thank you our uh, the the gratitude and thanks are huge from here and mutual um it's i feel reluctant to come in i mean not that this shouldn't wind down because of the time especially the time where you are but this has just been wonderful that what the rapport between the two of you i it does make one long for being in the same place and Maybe it starts shifting to going somewhere to eat or drink and, and music being part of it. Um, but both of you, it's been <laughs> what, what you've drawn out of each other and into each other and with around, around this remarkable book. But everywhere else the two of you have talked and touched on has been great and the questions that have come as well. Um, I, in my kind of earlier rushing about to say things, I've neglected a few things. Uh, and, and even the bio information I had sort of read wasn't even up to date because it mentioning you having been shortlisted and longlisted for the Apertondo and Kane prizes. I was actually looking at something else while we were doing this. And I, I believe the bookshop in um, Vintok is called the Book Den. 
that's where you would be buying your book and if you were in if in Vintook, they were congratulating you and I uh, this spring you received the Commonwealth Prize I, I was uh, for work um, so that congratulations on that as well. Um, and and again, both of you coming back to this at the end, the work you've each done for other writers, um, pandemic times and otherwise, I'm sure if we at some point, and this is of course, it doesn't have to be reading about it in the US to know how good or important the work is, but if word starts coming out about this writer or that writer um, coming out of Namibia, chances are I'm sure they'll have had what Remy has done will have had some part in that, whether or not they even know Remy, I mean, those, these things happen in these ways. And I was thinking too of Sarah's work with Hedgebrook where um, an example would be picking up Bernardine Evaristo's um, Girl, Woman, Other, which after several books became the book of hers that got this audience. And if you read the acknowledgements and it's about three lines of names of people's names, there's one name that's not a, a person and it's Hedgebrook, meaning I'm going, wow, it's, she flew over. And she's similarly since helped other writers go there. So I mean, there's these things where um, how the, the you talk about sharing of stories and, and that's been part of this, each of you with stories here um, and helping others to develop and share theirs is so vital um, in this world and in this life. So thank you again, both of you and er everyone who's joined us um, from all the places um, you are um, and to be continued in, in the reading and in when we get together in real life, but also in other ways like this and Good travels to you, Sarah. I said you've got some work coming up as an author again. Um, good luck with that. And mm -hmm. Karen, thank thank you to you. You put all this information on about what Remy's work and Sarah's work as well. And um, thank you both. Um, hope to see you in 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 the real life someday. Uh, Remy, one last question: Do you have books of stories coming, or do you write stories? Are you writing? Do you have other writing coming? Other writing coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm always working on something. So this is my debut. Uh, my talented and very supportive agent and I are cooking up some 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 things in the pipeline. Okay, um, but that's the story. <laughs> my prizes are being for stories, so that's those are good books too. So, um, if that happens, so thank you again and um, good evening and good day and um, take care, everyone. Thank you both. Thank you, Sarah. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.